church. We're so thankful to be together with you on this, the fourth and final Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season where we remember the Lord's coming to us. He came to us that very first Christmas as a baby in Bethlehem. He continues to come to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is coming again at the end of this age to deliver us from all evil. So let's open up our hearts to receive Jesus, our King. And let's be filled with his presence, even as we prepare for his return. If you're able, would you stand with us? wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out. He will not raise his voice in the streets. He will not break a bent twig. He will not put out a dimly burning flame. He will be faithful and make everything right. He will not grow weak or lose hope. He will not give up until he brings justice to the earth. This is the word of the Lord.
I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. This is the word of the Lord.
expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art Let's find our seats. And now, church, let's quiet our hearts for a moment. And if you're willing, I invite you to take an open prayer posture with your arms outstretched, your palms facing up. And let's turn to Jesus and bring all that we are to him in prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, angels described your birth as good news of great joy meant for all people. But after your birth, an angel also warned your father to flee the wrath of a bloodthirsty, power-hungry king. Matthew's gospel tells us that you became a refugee as the king killed innocents, and the sound of crying and deep sadness filled Bethlehem. Jesus, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and yet you are described as a man of sorrow, familiar with pain. You tell us to rejoice in all circumstances, and yet your anguish burst capillaries in Gethsemane. The joy you offer is complex and not afraid of the minor notes that accompany this life. You put on flesh to dwell among us, to bring true joy to the world, not a cheap counterfeit. You came to make your blessings flow far as the curse is found by experiencing just how deep that curse extends. So Jesus, in this sacred space and time, we give you the places of our lives that feel heavy and hard. The things that make joy feel elusive. Please meet us in these spaces today. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with your Holy Spirit. Let's continue in prayer together. God with us and for us in all circumstances and in every hard thing, you show us that joy and suffering can coexist. So we light this third candle to remember the joy you offer. Joy that doesn't just withstand trial, but grows through it. Weeping may endure for the night, but you promise that joy comes with the morning. 
Help us to trust your promises even when we can't remember what it feels like to wake without weariness. May the intersection of sorrow and joy become the place where you come to find us and be with us to comfort, strengthen, and restore us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For you've come to bring peace, to be loved, to be nearer to us. Lord, you've come to bring life, to be light, to shine bright. worshiping with us in the abiding presence of Jesus. those whose knees give way. Say to those whose hearts are afraid, be strong and do not fear, your God will come. He will pay your enemies back. He will come to save you. A wide road will go through the land, 
It will be called the way of holiness. Only those who lead a holy life can use it. Unclean and foolish people can't walk on it. No lions will use it. No hungry wild animals will be on it. None of them will be there. Only people who have been set free will walk on it. Those the Lord has saved will return to their land. They will sing as they enter the city of Zion. Joy that lasts forever will be like beautiful crowns on their heads. They will be filled with gladness and joy. Sorrow and sighing will be gone. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Joy to the church. God, we thank you for the joy that goes beyond sorrow, a joy that sustains us, a joy that carries us forward into the next day and the next day, and a joy that is merged with the hope of your return, where you will come and wipe all the tears from our eyes, and sorrow and sadness will be gone. So God, as we journey toward Christmas, as we journey to the celebration of hope's fulfillment and the birth of Jesus, may that sustain us toward that day. 
of Jesus' second return or his return where he makes all things new. And we pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Every holiday season, our church supports several initiatives that help our Columbia community at large. One of those is Operation Christmas Child. We wanted to give you an update on how you helped make it a huge success this year. Operation Christmas Child is a ministry of Samaritan's Purse, and they deliver shoebox gifts to children all over the world in about 150 different countries. The children have not received um, any gifts. They usually, you know, there's no money to celebrate holidays, things like that. So The Crossing has been involved for about 10 years with Operation Christmas Child. This year, The Crossing and its members were able to collect over 1,600 shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. Along with The Crossing Church, there are 13 other Central Missouri churches that collect shoeboxes as well. And so this year, the grand total was 20,777 shoeboxes for our area. We are so grateful for this wonderful partnership. If you came planning on giving, you can do that by texting any dollar amount to the number below. You can also give online at thecrossingchurch.com. And if you're in person today, we have offering towers as you exit the auditorium. I want to encourage anyone who has been attending The Crossing regularly to consider joining a small group. They're a great next step to develop significant friendships and make a large church feel small. If you're beyond your 20s, you can learn about small groups by attending one of two small group previews in January. Scan the QR code on the seat in front of you or visit the events page at thecrossingchurch.com for more information. Next weekend is Christmas and I wanna make sure everyone knows the details of our services. On Friday, we will have in-person and online Christmas Eve services at 2.30, 4, and 5.30. Then on Sunday, the normal service times of 8.30, 9.45, and 11 will be online only. So wherever you are, we can join in together online on Sunday. And now, here's today's message. I was reminded of a story recently that happened years ago when I was like 24 years old. I was, my wife and I were on staff with a campus Christian ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. It's called Crew Now. And we were at the University of Missouri campus. And I was like, like I said, 24. And so a lot of the students that I worked with were close to my age and actually became really close friends. And one of them, when he was a student, he's a sophomore. And uh, we were back at my house. We were back in my master bedroom. And uh, we were looking at something, doing something. I can't remember why we were back there. But he, I forgot something that when we walked in, he saw. And that was my clock radio completely smashed to smithereens on the hardwood floor. And I, I just panicked when I saw it. And he looked at it and he goes, what happened here? And I said, and I kind of had the George Costanza look in my eye of kind of looking around for an excuse. And I said, oh, I reached over to turn off the alarm and it fell off the shelf and it broke. And he's looking at it and he goes, no, that's not what happened here. <laughs> he goes, that, that, that clock was thrown on the ground hard. And I said, yeah, it was. I lost my patience the night before. I got really frustrated, and I took my clock radio that I'd had since college, and I just threw it on the floor. And I, in spite of my attempt to re-narrate what happened, the evidence was clear that didn't just fall off the shelf. Embarrassing, of course. But I think there's like something like just that in the middle of the room, so to speak, when it comes to human history. And that's the story of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. I mean, there are all these attempts to re-narrate it. You heard many if you took religion classes in college. You hear many if you're on the internet today. There are all kinds of ways to try to re-narrate the story, but the fact still remains something big happened 2,000 years ago. And we, we, we remind ourselves of it this time of year in, in two ways. The one is Christmas. I mean, all over the world, people are celebrating Christmas, not necessarily recognizing the word Christ in the Christmas. But also, a week later, everybody's going to advance their clock, their, their calendar, one more year since the life of Christ. Something big happened 2,000 years ago. The evidence is right there 
in the middle of the room of the human story and nobody is paying attention because everybody's buying the re-narration. And I think another thing is also evidence right there in the middle of the human condition, and that's the reality of evil. You ever think about that? It's not talked a lot these days. Nobody really says it because people have tried to re-narrate it. The reality of the presence of evil that's purpose is to destroy what's good, to corrupt what is for good. And no matter what happens in the advancement of human society, we might develop new technology, technologies, and we see all these good that the technology can do, the smartphone, the internet, the automobile, all these things that have so much potential for good, and all these institutions and all these organizations that have so much potential for good, and all these people that start off with good causes, and yet something always eventually happens where what that had high hopes becomes something corrupted and turned into something that is used for evil, used to destroy, used to destroy what is good. I mean, article after article is telling us Website after website that's being used to whether convince people, teenagers to commit suicide in the New York Times this week or convince teenagers to have eating disorders, Wall Street Journal this week, or whatever it is that's convincing people to do something that's very self-destructive for the pure purpose of evil. And hackers and all the things that destroy what could otherwise be good. Now, what re-narration have you bought that has somehow gotten your eye off the evidence right there in the middle of the human condition that evil is something that's real? What's your explanation for it? If you believe in just a material universe, what's your explanation for this? Every generation, a new evil happens afresh, alive, Every generation, we never get away from it. No matter how advanced we get as a culture, no matter how much we might explain things as a culture, evil never seems to go away. It's right there all the time, and sometimes it even grows with the growth of technology. Well, I, I think the Bible, I think the Bible is the biggest evidence right there in the middle of human history and the human condition that I think is that in spite of the efforts to re-narrate it, I think the Bible is the best explanation for the reality of the story of Jesus and the reality of evil. And the Bible itself is its best explanation for its narration, its story being the truth, the real narrative of human history and the human condition. And it starts in the very first pages of the Bible. In Genesis, We looked at this a little bit a couple weeks ago. I want to come back, and we're going to look at it here in a minute, because in Genesis 3, what we see as this poetic metaphor for evil is this serpent, this Hebrew word that means serpent, it means snake. Now, in the ancient Near East, snake was something that was a reality where it makes perfect sense that it would be just, evil would be described personified as a snake. You look at a beautiful field. What's always true of a beautiful field are snakes. Rarely seen, always hidden, always present, and always deadly with the right bite. In every beautiful field, especially in the ancient Near East. And so it's not surprising then when the Bible's telling a story to people who are living in the ancient Near East it's going to use the story, the metaphor of a snake to describe the personification of this supernatural being. This supernatural being that is described as the most intelligent, the most deceptive, and this being that's lived all the thousand years of human history. And as the Bible unfolds, it explains this being not just as one, but as forces, spiritual forces of evil in the spiritual realm unseen, that are like snakes, always present, always hiding, and always deadly with their strike. 
And so we see this story where we find the serpent, he convinces humanity to reject the abundance of God and and take the transgression, thinking that's where it's going to be abundance, and it shrinks their lives. The evil always does. It shrinks their lives to nothing. And then we read where God speaks to this snake. And the snake, again, is representing in its snaky form. It's not that snakes are evil. It's a poetic to describe something deeper that's true about this spiritual being that, was, that caused sin to enter the human condition in the Garden of Eden. And so God speaks to this serpent and this snake, and he, and, and, and he speaks in a poetic way this one verse that, again, I, I feel bad because I'm not going to be able to communicate to you why I think this one verse is so incredibly awesome, and I think this one verse proves that the Bible is true and proves that the Christian narrative is the only true narrative that truly describes a human condition and defines the very story your life is in. I'm not going to do a very good job of convincing you of the reasons why I'm convinced, so let's just close in prayer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> let's try. Let me try and try to stick with me. Let me read one verse to you, and that's when God is speaking to Satan, the Bible goes on to say this is Satan that was the snake in the Garden of Eden. So when God speaks to Satan in Genesis 3.15, it's a poetic form, so it's got a lot of metaphor in it, and it's going to have things that kind of, are po- as poetry does, very symbolic. But it, God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now this is Eve, but it's poetry, and it might be pointing to another woman. Another situation, but the basic idea is between you and humanity and between your offspring, the serpent's offspring, and hers. Now, offspring is one of those words in Hebrew, just like in English, when you read that, that can be a plural or it can be a singular. One offspring or lots of descendants. And it is both. The serpent has lots of offspring, the woman's going to have lots of offspring. But then it's going to zero in on one human male. Because it says in the very next, and these pronouns are just the same in the Hebrew, they're very specific. This offspring of hers, he of the woman, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now you're going, okay, why is that so profound? Well, again, because it's poetry, but what does the snake do when it kills? Well, it, it, it strikes the heel. You're walking, and it strikes the heel, and if it hits it right, you're going to die from its venom. And this very cryptic, poetic, one verse in the third page of the Bible, the third chapter of Genesis. Now, the, the, the Bible's a big book. Lots of verses, lots of chapters, lots of books. But all the way back to the very beginning, we get this one foreshadowing verse that's going to tell the rest of the entire story of the Bible, and it's going to predict the rest of the entire story of human history. Because what's going to happen is there's going to be a human male at some point that's going to come, an offspring of the woman, and he is going to crush the head of Satan. He's going to bring a decisive defeat to Satan and all of his forces. He's going to bring a decisive defeat of evil forever. But it's going to cost him his life because the serpent is also going to kill him in the process. Again, I'm not going to be able to convince you necessarily in one 25-ish minute sermon But I think this is so amazing because as we see the rest of the Bible unfold, it really is unfolding this verse without the author of this verse really understanding what this verse said. I really think this is one of those verses as evidence that ultimately the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author of Scripture. I don't think the author, I think Moses is the author, I don't think he understood the implications of that verse very well at all. The verse just hangs there. But what you have is this incredible story then that unfolds with the rest of the Bible. Now let me explain. The Bible is this book that was written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. 
that could not have conspired with one another. And this author here that just wrote the verse we just looked at that God said to Satan could not have had any understanding by himself of how this whole story was going to unfold. I don't even think he understood how the story was going to unfold. I think the Holy Spirit put that verse in the book. But it tells the rest of the story. And it's one of those things that nobody could really make up the rest of the story that would be written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. C.S. Lewis says this is one of the reasons why he became a Christian, and I'm going to simplify it with one quote, but he says this. He says, this is one of the reasons I believe Christianity. He writes this in Mere Christianity. Really good book, by the way. Uh, And he says, it is a religion you could not have guessed. You couldn't, he says this, it's not the sort of thing anyone would have made up. When you really understand the rest of the Bible and all the things that we don't understand about the rest of the Bible, when you understand the things that are embarrassing about the rest of the Bible and hard for pastors to understand and explain in the rest of the Bible, but yet how the rest of the Bible has this unfolding story that nobody could have made up, and it, it, it's, it's the biggest evidence for its own truthfulness because it was written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years that couldn't have conspired together. Didn't even know what these people were meaning in that verse. It's one of the reasons why Blaise Pascal, who was a French mathematician, philosopher in the 1600s, wasn't a Christian, but when he was in his 30s, he became a very, very committed Christian. And he says one of the reasons that convinced him to become a Christian, this is not a dumb guy, he he invented what became uh, eventually the computer, that's why there's a computer language named after him. He invented the syringe. Uh, and he's one of these really intelligent guys, but he said what finally convinced him to become a Christian was just reading the Bible and how the Bible was predicting the whole story all along in a way that would be impossible for the authors to know what they were writing at the time. And you wouldn't know it until the end of the story and you look back. This is why Jordan Peterson, he's a non-Christian But one of the things he said, I heard him say in a video I was watching, he was being interviewed by a guy, and he said, which is the greatest miracle, that the Bible is true or that the Bible is untrue? Because if it's untrue, that in itself is a miracle because the way it predicted its own story is impossible. Now, when people talk like this, I've been a Christian long enough to see what happens in people's lives When people start talking like this as non-Christians, they eventually become Christians. I don't know what will happen to Jordan Peterson, but I think he's on a journey. But the amazing thing is this, is that the story then just hangs. This verse says that there's going to be a male offspring who's going to crush the head of evil forever. But in doing that, it's going to cost him his life. It hangs there. In Genesis, it never is referred to, never picked up. It's just sort of a verse that, huh? And it's just sort of you move on. Nobody really pays attention to it. Several chapters go by, and then God appears and speaks to this guy named Abraham. And he promises Abraham something similar. He says, through your offspring, all the nations on earth will be blessed. Now, that's a silly, silly thing. Let's look at the, one of the places where God says it is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. God says, I will make your descendants, this is offspring, but the NIV is translating it descendants as plural. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Now, that's laughable at the time this was written. At the time this was written, well, this is written, let's just say, uh, if, if, if this is Genesis, it was written around 1400 B.C. Let's go ahead and grant the most skeptical view of Old Testament authorship and say it was written 500, 400 B.C. I don't believe that for a minute, but you have to say that as the latest time because eventually you have these older texts that we know that are centuries before Christ that were translated into Greek. We have an entire Greek Old Testament that's there 200 years before Jesus is born. So you have to allow certain centuries for certain, certain things to happen. The very, the very most recent you can say that was written was five centuries before Jesus. 
and yet still at that time, now I don't believe that, I believe it was written 1400 years before Jesus, but still at that time, it would be laughable, even more laughable for Israel, for the Jews to think that somehow through them, every nation on earth would be blessed. That whatever happens, that whatever happens through the descendant of Abraham, it's going to be, become global in scope. And yet it has happened. Here we are in, what, 2,000-something years after the birth of Jesus, by the way. That's how the years are said, remember? Here we are, and Christianity is the most multi-ethnic human movement in human history. On every continent on the globe. More Christians in Africa, more Christians in Asia, more Christians in Latin America than in North America. It is a global exactly this. And, and then, because the descendants became those descendants through this next part, and through your offspring, singular, all nations on earth will be blessed. It was laughable at the time. But then centuries go by, and now this king, David, and Old Testament books go by, we're reading through Old Testament books, Judges and, and Joshua, and you're reading all the Ruth, and you're reading through Old Testament books, and a thousand-ish years goes by. And now this king rises in Israel. There's archaeological evidence of King David being king of Israel, about 1100 B.C. And this king rises in Israel, and God promises him in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, that through his descendants, there's going to come a king who will be king forever over the entire world. And then centuries goes by, 400 years goes by, till we get to about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And then the Bible says through this prophet named Isaiah, the Bible says this in Isaiah 9, you know this verse because it's cliche around Christmas, but try to separate it from that and think of it as the story of the whole Bible. And what is it saying? It says, for to us is born, for to us a child is born, and to us a son, here comes this male seed, this male offspring, a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor mighty God. So here's the prediction 700 years before Jesus of a son to be born who's going to be mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it goes on to say this. It says, he will reign over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness, getting rid of evil completely from that time on and forever. 700 years before Jesus is born. Here's a document. We know the document is there. We know it was written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. Nobody denies that. We have it right there in antiquity, and it's predicting exactly this. A son's going to come. He's going to be called Mighty God, and he's going to destroy evil and reign forever. But then it says this. It says this in chapter 53, same prophet, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now again, I want you to catch this. It's going to be hard for me to somehow infuse my excitement into you, because it's, but what we just read there, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, 700 years after Genesis was written, is exactly what we read in Genesis 3.15 when God said to the serpent, when God said to the snake, there's going to be an offspring of the woman who's going to come. He's going to crush your head forever, but you're going to strike his heel. It's going to be at the cost of his own life. That's what this prophet just said. And then 700 years goes by, and we read when you open your New Testament and you crease the page and you start reading in the very first book of the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew in the very first chapter, the most boring chapter in the Bible because it's the genealogy of Jesus. We all want to skip it. But what it's doing is taking the birth of Jesus through Mary all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and showing you how this is the seed, this is the offspring of the woman who came to destroy the works of the devil and it's going to cost him his own life. 
And Jesus goes around saying he's the I am. And Jesus goes around doing these miracles to show that only God could do this through him. And Jesus eventually allows himself to be killed by Satan. Satan, remember, prompted Judas to betray Jesus, inspired the religious leaders to kill them. And they killed Jesus. They crucified Jesus. And that was the striking of the heel by the serpent. But then Jesus broke through the other side of death. The whole thing became part of the provision of God, it turns out. Because what God had said to Adam, the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. That death came on Jesus himself, that the cross of Jesus became the whole point. And that when Satan struck his heel and Jesus died, that was defeating, crushing the head of Satan. In an already not yet kind of way, Jesus rose from the dead and he promises resurrection to all those who are in his kingdom and he's building his kingdom right now and he's giving us a chance to be in it. And as the rest of this human history unfolds, this is a story that's still in play. I want to take a minute real quick here and watch a video by The Bible Project. Just real quick, I want to watch a video that I think explains what I just said a little bit better. Let's just take a moment here and watch it. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake. And it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total chumps. They give in to the snake, they choose evil, they go after money and sex and power and following other gods. Things get so bad that they run the nation of Israel right into the ground and the big bad empire of Babylon just takes them out. And so now there are no more kings to even fulfill this promise. So it seems like the whole plan is lost. But during these dark days, there's this crazy group of guys called prophets. And they just kept talking about this coming king and reminding us of the promise that he'll come, he'll defeat evil, he'll restore the garden. Now, one specific prophet, Isaiah, he tells us more about why this king is bitten. Isaiah says that the promised king receives this wound because of humanity's evil, and then it kills him. But then all of a sudden he comes back, and Isaiah says it's because he suffered this wound that he can now become a source of healing to other people. 
But the Old Testament ends, and the snake-crushing king that everyone's been talking about never shows up. And this is why, when the New Testament begins, it introduces us to Jesus of Nazareth, not as some random guy, but as someone who comes to fulfill these specific ancient promises. Yeah, we learn that he's from the line of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he goes around Israel announcing that the goodness of God's kingdom is here now. And he begins confronting the effects of evil on people by healing them, by forgiving them of their sins and evil. Many people are now believing that this is, in fact, the promised king. But Jesus began telling his closest followers that he was going to become king and bring peace by taking the full effect of humanity's evil into himself. The fatal snake bite wound. Exactly. And so it seems like the serpent wins. And this story actually would be a tragedy except for what happens next. Jesus rises from the dead. And now Jesus has the power over evil and death for himself. And so the rest of the New Testament is then making this claim that Jesus's power over evil and death has now become available to us to begin confronting the effects of evil in our lives. But even still, death and evil are a real problem in our world all around us. And so the story of the Bible ends by describing this future day when Jesus comes back and he finishes the job. He destroys the snake once and for all and he restores the goodness of the garden here on earth. Let me ask you this. How much do you believe that narrative? The narrative that Jesus has come. Here we are celebrating Christmas with the entire world. We're going to change calendars one more year with the entire world. How much do you think that narrative in the Bible really is the narrative of the human condition, of human history that your life is in? Do you believe that narrative or the re-narratives that come at you every generation that never seem to have a longer life than their own death? Let's say you believe it's 60% and you doubt 40%. Are you letting the lesser 40% drive your life? Why would you do that? Why would you let the lesser faith drive your decisions, drive whether or not you want to do what Jesus says when he says in the Lord's Prayer, we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. The sense that it's God's will that allows me to be part of this people of the offspring of the woman who's going to crush evil and bring about righteousness and love and good and beauty and glory forever when the kingdom of God returns. Which part of that story do you want to live in? If, if it would be represented by your, your hand and you close your fist when you say, no, I don't want to have, I don't want to submit to the king, I want to keep my life story in my own hands, or do you want to open up and say, no, I, I want the will of the king in my life. I want to live in that story for that kingdom, closed or open. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, there's, there's not 100% proof. It's not self-evident. We have to look at the evidence and we have to have faith either way, whether to believe the story or to not believe the story and to believe instead some other narrative. Our belief is faith either way. But God, if, if it's real in our hearts, even 60%, I pray that you would help us to see that it makes no sense to close our fist to your will, but to open and to submit to Jesus as our King, as our Christ, as our Messiah. That his will is life, his will is righteousness, his will is love and glory and the end of evil forever. We believe the Bible's amazing story, evidenced through its amazing story. And we give our life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to receive God's blessing from, blessing from Ephesians 1.18? May God open the eyes of your heart that you may know the hope to which he's called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance for those who are in Christ and his incomparably great power for those who believe. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Have a great day.